morning. I actually like Morgan Freeman's voice. I don't really want to compete with him. Um, well, I hope, I hope this is a great weekend for parents. Uh, I, my daughter has uh, just turned 15, actually, and so she's not uh, going to college yet, but I've got a couple of uh, goddaughters that are here, and actually, uh, when one of them moved in two months ago, I was with her mom and dad, um, uh, you know, helping her move into the dorm. And I'm the provost here, which means uh, I'm over the entire academic establishment. The deans report to me. <laughs> you, yeah. when, when I got hired here, my mom said, do, do they know what they're doing? Uh, so anyway, I, I, I'm helping her move in. I'm just standing around, and, and I had this uh, surrogate parental moment. I said to her, if any boys here cause you trouble, you just talk to me. Because I can make their life really hard. And I realized I, that's probably not what I should be saying uh, as the provost, but I have, I have a sense, though, of what it's like to be a parent, what it's like to be a grandparent, and, uh, and to, and to uh, entrust your child to a university. Uh, I've taught at several universities, uh, been at, on the faculty of a couple seminaries, and know a little bit about the landscape of Christian higher education in America. And I'd like to just assure you that as far as I'm concerned, this is the best place there is. Um, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, so uh, because the college years are about expanding vision, so I think they are about, they're about expanding vision, about expanding career vision, about expanding your, your sense of the world, about expanding uh, your understanding of, of history and other cultures, uh, and they're also about uh, expanding and rearranging or realigning your spiritual vision. I thought we'd pick a, a topic, a, a text, that has to do with, uh, has to do with vision. And so I uh, picked a text from the Gospel of John, John 6, 1 through 15, which is the story of uh, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, one of the very few stories that's in every single Gospel. But we're not going to start there. We're going to start here. That's me at the bottom. In 1968, uh, looking squirrely, some personality traits manifest early in life and persist through. Uh, that's my dad, obviously, and my sister Gail, and my brother Brad, and that's my mom. So this is a story about my mom. This is my mom years later. Uh, so that's my daughter. We lived in Chicago at the time. Uh, this was November when it's about 28 degrees. People in Chicago think it's fun when it's 28 degrees to go for a, a ride in a horse-drawn carriage downtown. You can, we, people here think it's time to put on gloves if it's below 70, so it's a different, <laughs> different idea. Um, but that's my mom and our, and our daughter t uh, 10 years ago. Oh, I should be able to make this work there. Oh, no, I need to back up. There we go. There's an aerial view of my mom's house. So uh, I grew up in the Bay Area, and uh, when my dad retired, my parents moved up to the foothills outside of Auburn. So think about that. They bought a house in the Bay Area in about 1959. They paid about $7 for it. <laughs> and they sold it uh, 35, 40 years later for $840 trillion. And they had enough money to buy a little bit of land. So this is out in what used to be an orchard. So this is an aerial view. And, uh, and the hill is falling away from the house, so down toward the bottom of the photograph. The only thing you need about my mom is she loved to prune. She was like the, uh, not, so much the not so much like the, like the fairy godmother of pruning, because well, one time when my wife and I had been married a year, Christina called me and said, there's something wrong at the house. Well, what's wrong? Well, someone has pruned all the bushes but, left, but not picked it up. It's, it's lying all over the place. So I thought, oh, that's my mom's been there. Yeah, she, she loved to prune but didn't like to, oh, man, I'm having trouble. Didn't like to clean up. So anyway, uh, now when this story happened, my mom was about 80, and my dad had passed away. And it was summer, 
So if you know anything about Sacramento in the summer, it can be like 105. So it's about 100, 102 that day. My mom called me in the afternoon and said, do you know what happened today, Davey? No, Mom, what happened? Oh, well, I was, she said I was pruning down below, and I fell, and I couldn't get up. I wasn't strong enough to, to, to stand up. And I knew I had to get to that rock about, it's about 60 yards away, before I could, so I could sit on the rock and then have enough strength to get my feet under me and stand up. So she said, Davy, for an hour and a half, I scooted on my bottom to get to that rock. And as she's telling me this, I'm thinking, you know, to myself, wow, I mean, we've got all sorts of issues that we have to start thinking about, you know, uh, uh, live-in care issues and everything else. And then she said, and do you know what, Davy? What, Mom? The whole time I was scooting on my bottom, I kept on pruning. <laughs> so then I wasn't worried about the care issues anymore. She was on the ground. She's 80 years old and she's on the ground. And she's vulnerable. But she had a different vision. Even though she was on the ground, she could see higher. Our text, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have even a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five uh, barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So what did they see? Well, they saw somebody with amazing power, power to do miracles. They saw that he fed their appetites, and they drew this conclusion. We should make him king. How interesting, that last verse. When he saw that he intended to come and take him by force and make him king, he withdrew. Imagine the gall of telling Jesus what sort of king he should be. Their appetites. What did they see? They drew that conclusion. He can fit our desires, our needs. Thought about the reaction of people in the Gospels generally when Jesus does a miracle. Some people see him do a miracle and are merely excited about the material product, food. Others see him do the same miracle and they say he's a blasphemer. But some see that same miracle and say, this is God at work. We had better aim our gaze a bit higher beyond ourselves. But that's the way it is. I listen to a lot of evangelicals talk, and I talk to a lot of evangelicals. And I think we really think 
the way we live our lives every day, that we really think most of the time that as if it's God's job to protect us from harm, to grant us that warm and wonderful feeling of contentment we desire, and to make our lives easier. But the New Testament tells a very different story. If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, deny your basic inclination. Or we are told that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. How different is the witness of Christians who have gone before. So this is a painting of St. Augustine, uh, and that's his mom, Monica, who was the, the one who prayed for him like any good parent. Her son, brilliant, extraordinary, from a little backwater town in North Africa called Tagaste, population of about 2,000. He rose to become the equivalent of someone who's on the, on the cabinet of the prime minister or in the very power circles of Washington, a close advisor to the emperor, meteoric. And the whole time he lived a life of dissipation and she prayed for him every single day. And when he finally came to faith, it was the joy of her heart. Augustine said this, they are your best servants who long not so much to hear what they desire from you as to desire what they hear from you. That's, I'm gonna say that again because that is just rich. They are your best servants who long not so much to hear what they desire from you as to desire what they hear from you. Who gets to decide the agenda? Is it us? Or is it the God we say we serve in whose hand we say our lives belongs. But we resist that new vision. Think about Andrew in the text. Here's a little boy with some bread and some fish, but what good will this be compared to so many? We resist the new vision. I think it's because we're used to seeing only our own way, because we're satisfied that way because our culture tells us it's all right to operate that way. We want bread to eat. So it leads me to a conclusion, that is uh, we're captive to our appetites because they are in us and we live in a culture that celebrates this. So uh, this is the Roman poet Ovid, uh, lived about the time, uh, yeah, he died in 18 AD, so just about the time that Jesus was coming to maturity. And uh, his most famous work is called The Metamorphosis, and what he did was gather all the wisdom from the stories in the ancient world, in Greece and Rome, etc. So all the stories we knew from school, you know, the story of Icarus, etc., all that we know because Ovid gathered it together and, and, and presented us with the uh, definitive version of those stories. And he tells this one story, that what's called the myth of Erisichthon, about this king. About this king who had insatiable desire and that he couldn't ever eat enough. Finally, he ate everything there was. He ate his house and he ended up eating himself. And the myth is to, meant to tell us, to make this point. Lodged within us is an incurable seemingly incurable attachment to self. And if we're not careful, it will destroy us. We are our own worst enemy. Nice hat, Martin Luther. Martin Luther. There's a, the Latin phrase, in curvatus in se. What he meant there is, we are curved in upon ourselves. Luther wrote this in his commentary on Romans, the great commentary on Romans, the, the one book, you could say, that caused him or that was the fruit of him sparking the Reformation. He said this, our nature has been so curved in upon itself because of human sin that we even seek God for selfish reasons. You ever thought about that? Sometimes we seek God not for who God is, but for what he does for us, or what he hopes, we hope he will do for us. 
This is Augustine again, one of my, he's my, I always try to sneak two references into Augustine because he's my favorite guy, so I'm sorry. Uh, but Augustine put it this way, so wise, be careful what you love because we become subject to what we love and subjects cannot judge. As you walk through life, and especially today, when we are bombarded endlessly with new stuff, be careful what you choose to love because you will become subject to it and you will lose the ability to judge rightly whether this is healthy or wholesome or it's actually causing your destruction. And now Luther again. He said, the greatest trouble we can even know is thinking that we have no trouble. For we have become hard-hearted and insensible to what is inside of us. probably noticed this, that um, we have, as human beings, we have the ability uh, to become jaded. So I'm guessing that most people in this room are too young to remember this, but there was a time two decades ago when there was a conflict, a war going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And for the first time in my lifetime, people were talking about widespread genocide as if it was actually, uh, it was a current event. And Americans were absolutely shocked that that was going on. But a month and a half later, when we'd seen those images so many times, and they came on the screen again, Americans just picked up their remote and turned to ESPN. We get jaded. And so Luther says, not only are we, do we have this self-destructive tendency within us, but we're not even sensitive enough to recognize it. We need to wake up. We need to reckon with it. That's why Luther described the spiritual life in the Latin there as a sensus mentis ad deum, a climbing up out of oneself to God. The question is to whom are we attached? To ourselves or to the God who saved us? So know what's inside you, reckon with it. This isn't so simple as prosaic selfishness, our tendency to look out for ourselves. So last week, um, Somebody gave me a box of C's candy, chocolate-covered almonds, dark chocolate. Maybe the second most favorite thing in my entire life. And I will confess that as there are now only eight left, I have hid two of them away in my office so that when people come by, knowing I have that box, and without saying anything, but just sort of look over there longingly, I can open the box and know that I've squirreled away two for me. That's pathetic. <laughs> but I'm not, I don't think I'm really all that sorry. I'm just recognizing it's pathetic. What I'm talking about here is, is much deeper than that. It isn't so simple, so light, so airy. It's much deeper. It is a deeper, basic attachment to self. And so, in the spiritual life, in the 2,000 years of Christians who've gone before us, of people who have walked this walk, people who have experience of growth in Christ, people will use terms like this to describe it. Surrender. Surrender yourself. Turn from attachment to self to God. Dying to self is a New Testament image. There's a woman, uh, a, 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 a master in the history of Christian spirituality and the spiritual life, Catherine of Genoa. This is what she wrote. Our self-will is so subtle and so deeply rooted within ourselves and defends itself with such varied skills that when we try to fight it, we lose in the end. When we consider things as they truly are, we realize we need to cultivate a desire to live without self-will. It won't happen by itself. You need to be intentional and cultivate that desire. 
Paul put it this way, it's no longer I who live, but Christ in me who loved me and gave himself up for me. But we have fallen into the trap our culture sets. And that is that we are our appetites. If you desire it, you deserve it. You should have it. Bad are the people who stand in your way. On my way to work, listening to Christian radio, I learned that I deserve to have my mortgage readjusted. Listening to ESPN, I learned that I deserve a vacation in Las Vegas. I deserve a new car. I deserve a better job. It's amazing what I deserve. And the people saying I deserve these things don't even know who I am. Our culture woos us into thinking that our appetites define us. But the gaze that Christ beckons us to hold is very different. In fact, even the pagan ancients knew that a gaze only on the self is ultimately destructive. So how do we escape? Well, um, the nice thing about the story we read is that what we have, Jesus can transform. This is barley bread. Looks like something on your shoe. So barley bread in the ancient world was the roughest, rudest, lowest kind. Nothing fancy, nothing nice, nothing to look forward to. And it's barley bread that that kid has. The lowest, the least appealing. What, the, the thing that no one would choose if they were in line. It's not fine artisan bread. It's not cake. I'm sure those of you who are in your first year here have discovered that this can be breakfast now. That was an awesome discovery when I was like three months into my freshman year where I realized I can put chocolate milk on my Cocoa Krispies and no one will tell me not to. <laughs> one of the things I like about working at a university is that I can still do, I can still do that. <laughs> but it's not cake and it's not tiramisu. It's barley bread. It's rough and it's rude, and Jesus transformed it. Now the text, the chapter just before, is the story of the woman at the well. Now it's often conjured that she uh, has lived a dissolute life, but you know in the ancient world, if you're a woman uh, and your husband dies or he divorces you, you don't have any options. So to suppose that she has chosen this is really um, extraordinary. It's more likely that life has just beat her up a lot and she has no choice. Think about what she feels about herself, how rejected she feels, how, how marginalized she feels. She doesn't even come out to the well until she thinks no one else will be there. And then she sees this Jewish guy out there and she can only imagine, I suppose, that what, what he's gonna do, reject her utterly, and instead he engages her in conversation. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, you're a treasure in the sight of God. What you have and who you are, he can transform. Barley bread becomes the miracle. Don't worry if you continue to struggle and fail. The Christian life is a journey after all the upward call. So, 
What does it all mean? Like one thing it means is uh, we, we probably don't do a very good job of, pro of practicing the poverty of dependence upon God. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Most of us don't have any worries about where we're going to eat tomorrow or today or even a month from now. We have plenty. What he's saying, among other things, is choose to live your life in dependence upon God as if you had no idea where your next meal was coming from. What would that be like? Me, I've got a stainless steel refrigerator at home with, I think, 36 eggs in the refrigerator because you can get two for 118. Simple economics. I don't, I don't live with that. I don't live with that daily dependence most days because I don't have to. Jesus urges us to choose to live in conscious dependence upon God. Secondly, deny yourself. Reckon with yourself. Understand yourself. Be a student of yourself and recognize the ways in which you are attached. You are turned toward yourself and to the degree that's true, you are detached and turned away from God. Recognize trial. You know, the New Testament curiously says that we should be happy when we encounter difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> when we en ever encounter someone who's, who, who is happy like that, like bubbly right away, and you're thinking, they ought to go see somebody about that. <laughs> but here's the reason. Um, and actually, this is another ancient writer, a Aeschylus, uh, in his Agamemnon, wrote this beautiful phrase. Uh, so not even a Christian, but he knows this. It is the will of the gods that those who learn wisdom must suffer. And even in our sleep, pain which we cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until with it, unbidden and against our will, comes wisdom by the awful grace of God. The New Testament asserts that trials can be used by God to help us focus our attention on him and off of ourselves. Deny yourself, reckon, recognize trial, and then present yourself, because what we have, he can transform. So this is the great C.H. Dodd, probably the most, certainly the most important New Testament scholar of the 20th century writing in English. And he pointed out um, a beautiful, or made reference to a, a beautiful turn of phrase in the gospel about Jesus. He set his face to Jerusalem. He determined to go. He knew this would be his discomfiture. This would, be, would lead to his crucifixion. He set his face to it. He determined to do it. It was an act of will, an act of obedience. The considered subjugation of human inclination and human desire to the divine will, Dodd wrote, is the key to the whole story. To recognize that attachment to God is detachment from self. And then Dodd quoted... Paul in Romans, by the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. Jesus showed us the way. Jesus made it possible by defeating the power of sin within us. Paul means to say that in tracing the life of Jesus to its close, we are not simply reading the story of a good man condemned to martyrdom. We are instead reading about that, that moment at which history took a turn. And the work of Christ made possible the turn toward God and God's will and away from enslavement to our own wills. Deny, take up your cross, follow. Is your gaze too low? Or are your eyes lifted up? We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.